Real Time 1960s presents Evening Report, a complete roundup of today's news with Joe Rubenstein. Good evening. In Washington, President Johnson speaks to the nation. In New York, Robert Kennedy seeks to change his image. Ronald Reagan switches parties. Martin Luther King wins a Nobel Prize. And the Cardinals are champions of baseball. Those are the headlines, the details after this message. If you like things neat and clean, you'll like Parliament. Tobacco tastes best. Tobacco tastes best. When the filter's recessed. When the filter's recessed. Smoke neat, smoke clean, smoke Parliament. Tobacco tastes best when the filter's recessed. And Parliament's filter is recessed a neat, clean quarter inch away. That's Parliament's extra margin. If you like things neat and clean, you'll like Parliament. In a televised address tonight, President Johnson discussed two major international developments of the past week. Number one, the replacement of Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev by Leonid Brezhnev and Alexei Kosygin. And number two, Communist China's first atomic bomb explosion at the Lop Nor testing site in that nation's western region. Until this week, only four powers had entered the dangerous world of nuclear explosions. Whatever their differences, all four are sober and serious states with long experience as major powers in the modern world. Communist China has no such experience. Communist China's expensive and demanding efforts tempts other states to equal folly. Nuclear spread is dangerous to all mankind. For the lesson of Lopnar, is that we are right to recognize the danger of nuclear spread, that we must continue to work against it, and we will. Johnson also spoke on the power shift in the Soviet Union. Mr. Khrushchev was clearly the dominant figure in making Soviet policy. There were times when he was guilty of dangerous adventure. Yet he learned from mistakes, and he was not blind to realities. He joined in the nuclear test ban treaty. He agreed that space should be kept free of nuclear weapons. We do not think it was these actions that led to his removal. We cannot know for sure just what did lead to this secret decision. Our intelligent estimate is that Khrushchev learned of the decision only when, for him, it was too late. There has been discontent and strain and failure, both within the Soviet Union and within the communist bloc as a whole. These troubles are not the creation of one man. They will not end with his removal. Finally, Johnson spoke on his communications this week with the new Soviet government. The new Soviet government has officially informed me through Ambassador Dobrynin day before yesterday that it plans no change in its basic foreign policy. I told him that the quest for peace in America had never been more determined than it is now. I reminded the ambassador of the danger that we all faced two years ago in Cuba. I said to the ambassador that I would be ready to talk to anyone when it would help the cause of peace. I believe that this was a good beginning on both sides. This evening, Republicans declared their intention to demand equal time on TV for their presidential candidate, Senator Barry Goldwater charging that the president's speech, while apparently nonpartisan, was political in nature and could benefit his campaign. Campaign officials working for Robert F. Kennedy, who is currently running for the U.S. Senate from New York, are seeking to overcome what they view as a false image of the candidate as, quote, a tough guy prosecuting attorney, unquote. The campaign believes this image correction is just as important as attacking Kennedy's opponent, GOP Senator Kenneth Keating. Semi-documentary commercials produced by the campaign show Kennedy as an energetic, articulate, idealistic young man, similar to his late brother, President Kennedy. Many of the commercials include clips of a filmed event held on October 5th, when the candidate was questioned by students at Columbia University. At that session, One student asked Kennedy for his views on the McCarthy hearings of the 1950s. In 1953, Kennedy, then 27 years old, worked as an assistant counsel to the subcommittee chaired by the late Senator Joseph McCarthy. I was not involved in any of the communist hearing of Senator McCarthy during that period of time, which I worked for the committee. I worked for the committee for approximately six months. I disagreed with what was happening on the committee. 
I reached the conclusion that I didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I went to Senator McCarthy and I said that I disagreed with what they were doing and I wasn't going to stay with the committee any longer. And I left. I was the one that wrote the report on Senator McCarthy and the Army McCarthy hearings. I wrote that report, which was signed by the Democratic members and, and uh, was written by me. And uh, so that's my record. I believe at a rather young age, I stood up on the question of principle. Another student asked the candidate if he was actually using New York State as a jumping off point for his presidential ambitions. I don't know where I can jump off to uh, as we have a Democratic president. He's going to be elected in 1964. In my judgment, he's going to be reelected. He's going to get, uh, be reelected in 1968. So that the earliest that I'm going to be jumping off someplace <laughs> It's 1972, which is eight years from now. I'm going to have to be a wonderful United States senator from eight years. I'm going to have to get. A, I'm going to have to be reelected in six years. I don't see me working and making this kind of effort that New York loses anything by. I hear somebody else outside said, "Are you going to serve your whole six years?" Well, I don't know where I'd go. <laughs> but I frankly, I don't need the title because I could be called general. I understand for the rest of my life. I've been a. T- <laughs> And I don't need the money, and I don't need the office space. So I, I, I would just, I mean, frank as it is, and maybe it's difficult to understand in the state of New York, I'd like to just be a good United States senator. I'd like to serve. At the end of the session, Kennedy spoke on the importance of political involvement, especially among young people. President Kennedy's favorite quote was really from Dante. The hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in time of moral crisis preserve their neutrality. So if all of us, whether it's in the field of civil rights or housing or whether it's in Vietnam or whatever it is, just hang back and say this is a problem of somebody else. If we're going to permit what's going on in Harlem now, of those their young children grow up uneducated and untrained and dissatisfied with life and dissatisfied with their future and feeling that there is nothing in this system, then uh, we're going to be in difficulty. Even if we look at this selfishly, we're going to be in difficulty. The whole system's going to be in difficulty. Oh, I hope that I win as a United States Senator, but even if I don't, I think that for all of us, that we have an obligation. We have a responsibility. If we don't do it, then nobody's going to do it. And I think that we can. I think that we started it three and a half years ago, and I think we can continue it. And uh, I don't think it's just a question of political belief, but I think that we can make a difference. And so, thank you. I'll have more news for you after this message. What has happened to America? We've had the good sense to create lovely parks, but we're afraid to use them after dark. We build libraries and galleries to hold the world's greatest treasury of art, and we permit the world's greatest collection of smut to be freely available everywhere. The highest echelons of government are embroiled in scandals that are cynically swept under the rug. National morality, by example, and by persuasion should begin at the White House and have the good influence to reach out to every corner of the land. Now, this is not the case today because our country has lacked leadership that treats public office as a public trust. I pledge that Bill Miller and I will restore to America a dedication to principle and to conscience among its public servants. In your heart, you know he's right. Vote for Barry Goldwater. Here again, Joe Rubenstein. In Hollywood, a great many movie stars have become deeply involved in the presidential campaign. Last week, a thousand women paid $5 each to attend a Democratic Party rally at Goldwyn Studios, hosted by Gregory Peck, Henry Fonda, Eddie Fisher, Janet Leigh, and others. In the presidential contest, many younger stars apparently favor President Johnson, while Barry Goldwater, by and large, is supported by older performers. A recent Goldwater ad that ran in movie trade papers was signed by such veteran luminaries as Jimmy Stewart, John Wayne, Robert Taylor, Ginger Rogers, Mary Pickford, and Irene Dunn. Another member of the older generation of stars, Ronald Reagan, is serving as co-chairman for California Citizens for Goldwater. Earlier this month, the actor filmed the speech in support of Goldwater, which will be included in its entirety on Rendezvous with Destiny a TV program airing on the 27th of this month. I have spent most of my life as a Democrat. I recently have seen fit to follow another course. One side in this campaign has been telling us that the issues of this election are the maintenance of peace and prosperity. The line has been used, we've never had it so good. But I have an uncomfortable feeling that this prosperity isn't something on which we can base our hopes for the future. 
Today, 37 cents out of every dollar earned in this country is the tax collector's share. As for the peace that we would preserve, I wonder who among us would like to approach the wife or mother whose husband or son has died in South Vietnam and ask them if they think this is a peace that should be maintained indefinitely. We're at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said if we lose that war and in so doing lose this way of freedom of ours, history will record with the greatest astonishment that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent its happening. Later in the speech, Reagan linked the philosophy of the modern Democratic Party to socialism. Back in 1936, Mr. Democrat himself, Al Smith, the great American, came before the American people and charged that the leadership of his party was taking the party of Jefferson, Jackson, and Cleveland down the road under the banners of Marx, Lenin, and Stalin. And he walked away from his party and he never returned till the day he died. Because to this day, the leadership of that party has been taking that party, that honorable party, down the road in the image of the Labor Socialist Party of England. Finally, the actor extolled the virtues of Barry Goldwater. During the hectic split-second timing of a campaign, this is a man who took time out to sit beside an old friend who was dying of cancer. His campaign managers were understandably impatient, but he said there aren't many left who care what happens to her. I'd like her to know I care. This is a man who said to his 19-year-old son, there is no foundation like the rock of honesty and fairness. And when you begin to build your life on that rock, with the cement of the faith in God that you have, then you have a real start. This is not a man who could carelessly send other people's sons to war. And that is the issue of this campaign that makes all the other problems I've discussed academic, unless we realize we're in a war that must be won. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. On Wednesday, the 1964 Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. King will accept the award in person on December 10th in Oslo, Norway. The 35-year-old civil rights leader is the youngest winner of the prize since it was first awarded in 1901. Dr. King said he was deeply moved by the honor and that all of the prize money, which amounts to about $54,000, would be given to the civil rights movement. He added that while the award was personally gratifying, it held a larger significance. It is also gratifying to know that the nations of the world recognize the civil rights movement in this country as so significant a moral force as to merit such recognition. Sports, right after this. I'm a teacher. The election on November 3rd is very important. The opinions of the candidates differ greatly on matters of education. President Johnson was a teacher himself. Senator Goldwater said on October 3rd, 1960, in Jacksonville, Florida, the child has no right to an education. In most cases, the children can get along just as well without it. Now that isn't reasonable. President Johnson has signed over a dozen laws for the improvement of education. Laws about education for handicapped children, people displaced by automation, medical schools, graduate schools, training programs, and others. Senator Goldwater voted against all of them. On November 3rd, responsible educators will vote for President Johnson and Senator Humphrey. I hope you will join us. Your future and theirs depend on it. Vote for President Johnson November 3rd. The stakes are too high to stay home. In St. Louis Thursday, the Cardinals beat the Yankees 7-5 and captured the 1964 World Series. They won the seventh and final game behind the fastball pitching of Bob Gibson who struck out nine Yankees and survived three late home runs. It was the Cardinals' first championship since 1946 and the Yankees' second straight loss of the World Series. After Mickey Mantle's three-run homer in the top of the sixth made the score 6-3 St. Louis, Ken Boyer of the Cardinals responded with a solo shot in the seventh. However, in the top of the ninth, the Yankees put a scare into the Bush Stadium crowd of 30,346. With one out, Cleet Boyer, Ken's younger brother, stepped up to the plate. Bob Gibson, ready. Here's the payoff pitch to Cleet Boyer. Swung on, fly ball, deep to left field. Lou Brock is going back near the warning track. That ball is out of here. A home run for Cleet Boyer as he hit a 3-2 fastball. So it's now a 7-4 ball game. After Gibson struck out Johnny Blanchard for the second out, it was light-hitting Phil Linz's turn at bat. 
Bob Gibson delivers. Lins swings. Fly ball deep to left field. Lou Brock over near the line. Back, back. That ball is a home run for Phil Lins as Vinny Smith gives the sign. So Lins has hit a home run. And it's a 7-5 ball game. Johnny Keene pacing in the dugout. You know what's running through his mind. He'd like to see his pitcher get a complete game, but how far can he go? Next up was Bobby Richardson, who in the seventh inning had broken a World Series hit record with his 13th. One ball, one strike. Richardson waits. Gibson delivers. Swung on, popped up. Maxville at second base. Calling for it. Makes the catch. The Cardinals win it. And this ballpark, complete bedlam. The following day, Cardinals manager Johnny Keene shocked the world by resigning. The St. Louis native ended 35 years in the Cardinal organization with a letter he had written on September 28th when his team was a game and a half out of first place. On Friday, Keene handed the letter, which he and his wife had kept secret, to August Bush, owner of the Cardinals, half an hour before a news conference Bush had called to announce Keene's return as manager. Keene's letter offered no reason for the resignation, but sources indicate that Bush, over the summer, had been eager to replace Keene with Leo DeRocher, and that Keene had heard about those negotiations. It was only after the Cardinals won the pennant that Bush had changed his mind. But by then, it was too late. A second shock came two hours later in New York, when Yogi Berra was dismissed as manager of the Yankees. Ralph Houck, general manager of the Bombers and Berra's predecessor as field manager, announced the move at a hastily arranged press conference, which Berra did not attend. Houck declined to discuss the reasons for Berra's dismissal after only one year as manager, beyond his prepared statement that, quote, it was better for all concerned, unquote. Keene is now viewed as a leading contender for the Yankee job. And that, for this evening, completes our look at the latest news on this Sunday, October 18th, 1964. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day tomorrow. This has been your Evening Report, a roundup of the latest news with Joe Rubenstein.